in this lecture I'm going to give an overview of the Gospels and Acts. Those of you who have spent a semester with me on Mark, two semesters with me on Luke, two semesters with me on Matthew, and a semester and a half with me on John, and two semesters on Acts, will realize how ridiculous this is. But here we go. Mark is regarded by scholars as the first of the Gospels to be written. It was written about the year 70. That's the year the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, give or take a few years. It might have been a few years before it was destroyed with the Roman army surrounding it, or it might have been written a year or two after, but 70 is the peg date. He's often identified with the John Mark of the Acts of the Apostles, Perhaps it was written in Rome. According to tradition, Mark was influenced by the preaching of Peter. Now, if he wrote in Rome, it would be hard not to be influenced by Peter's preaching. The later legend goes that Peter dictates, Mark writes it down, Peter proofreads it and signs off on it. There's probably some truth behind that later legend. Someone has called Mark a passion narrative with an extended introduction. The first part of the Gospels to coalesce into an extended tradition would be the passion narrative. You would have the trial, the execution, the resurrection, so there's a natural order there. The Gospel is divided into two parts. Part one, basically the first eight chapters, the ministry and preaching of Jesus in Galilee. And then part two, the suffering predicted, we get three passion predictions, and then death in Jerusalem with resurrection. So the beginning and end of Mark, Mark begins with the story of the baptism of Jesus, and he ends with the story of the women at the empty tomb who are addressed by a revealing angel who tells them that Jesus is risen from the dead. The Gospel of Mark contains no story of Jesus appearing to anyone after he rose from the dead. Chapter 16 verses 9 to 20 was added about 50 years after the gospel was written by an anonymous scribe. So about the year 120 those verses were added and to show you that no good deed goes unpunished in the Catholic Church those are the verses we read on the feast of St. Mark. So, in effect, we're saying, Mark, nothing you wrote was worth reading on your feast day, so we're going to read this appendix that a scribe put on your gospel 50 years after you died. Matthew. The date is 80 to 90, give or take a, a decade. By second century tradition, it's written by Matthew, the tax collector, one of the twelve. Most scholars think that on the Feast of Matthew, Apostle and Evangelist, we're honoring two saints in heaven. One, the, uh, the member of the Twelve by that name who accompanied Jesus during his ministry. The other is the anonymous third generation Christian who wrote the gospel attributed to Matthew about the year 85. He was not an eyewitness. He drew on Mark and a collection of sayings a saying source that scholars call Q. If an American had invented this, we would call it S for source. But since it was a German and the word is Kavella, we call it Q for source. And he also had other traditions, uh, oral and written, that he mixed in with Mark and Q. He was probably a Jewish Christian. I would regard Matthew as, as the most Jewish of all of the Gospels. Where... Probably it was written in Antioch of Syria. So, an overview of the structure. To Mark's basic structure, Matthew has added first an infancy narrative, two chapters at the beginning, and second, resurrection appearance narratives at the end. Uh, first to the holy women, where Jesus repeats the message that the angel had told them at the tomb, and Second, an appearance to the eleven on a mountain in Galilee. Note, no New Testament author anywhere narrates the resurrection of Jesus. We have one, stories of the empty tomb, and two, stories of Jesus appearing 
So resurrection appearance narrative is a bit cumbersome, but it's more accurate than saying resurrection narrative. More details about the structure. Uh, the material between the infancy narrative and the passion narrative is given a five-fold structure. Perhaps he's imitating the five-fold structure of the, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. Uh, Matthew often uses Moses imagery to describe Jesus. Each section is divided between a narrative and a discourse given by Jesus. So in part one we have the famous discourse, the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7. The second discourse is the Mission Sermon in chapter 10. The third discourse is the Sermon in Parables in chapter 13. The fourth discourse is the Sermon on the Church in chapter 18. And the last one is the eschatological sermon in chapters 24 and 25. Eschatological is a fancy word for end of the world. Some material unique to Matthew. If we didn't have Matthew, we would not have the angelic announcement to Joseph in a dream, just as Joseph in the Old Testament dreamed dreams that saved God's people, so Joseph in the New Testament. The Magi and the star, the flight to Egypt, the slaughter of the holy innocents. We wouldn't have special stories about Peter. Peter walking on the sea. Matthew, Mark, and John have the story of Jesus walking on the sea. Only Matthew has Peter walking on the sea. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have Peter say, you are the Christ. In Matthew, he adds, the son of the living God. And only in Matthew does Jesus say back to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The favorite verse of every Catholic. That's only in Matthew. Or the, the story of the coin in the fish's mouth. And uh, last time I was in Israel, I... I had fish at a restaurant and on the menu was St. Peter's fish and so, so now I know what kind of fish it was. <laughs> the parables of the unforgiving servant, the workers in the vineyard and the last judgment, the sheep and the goats, only in Matthew. Also, these are in Luke, the Lord's Prayer and the Beatitudes, but Luke only has four Beatitudes. Matthew has the eight that everybody knows. And there are many people with their PhD in biblical studies who cannot recite Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. But most Christians who are five can recite Matthew's from memories. Luke, written about 85, give or take five or ten years. Scholars argue whether Matthew or Luke wrote first. Most scholars don't think one of them copied from the other, so it doesn't really make that much difference. The author by second century tra tradition is Luke, a physician, the fellow worker and traveling companion of Paul. A less well-attested tradition is that it was uh, a Syrian from Antioch. Scholars analyzing it say this is a, an educated Greek speaker and writer who knew the Jewish scriptures in Greek, who was not an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry, and like Matthew, he drew on Mark and Q, plus other traditions written and oral that are only available to him. He was probably not raised a Jew, but perhaps a convert to Judaism before he became a Christian. He seems to mess up Palestinian geography when he's writing his gospel, so we're pretty sure he wasn't Palestinian. And he wrote for primarily a Gentile audience. Uh, to Mark's basic structure, like Matthew, Luke has added an infancy narrative at the beginning and resurrection appearance narratives at the end. Now, if Matthew and Luke hadn't done this, the scribes probably wouldn't have been dissatisfied with Mark. At first, he was the best thing since sliced bread. But now he was starting to look inferior after these other Gospels had been published, so scribes helped Mark out. The resurrection appearances at the end are to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. 
and to the twelve in Jerusalem. We'll see there are no apparitions in Galilee in, in Luke. The journey narrative. One scholar has called this Jesus eating and drinking his way through Galilee. It takes Jesus one chapter to go from Galilee to Jerusalem in Mark, followed by Matthew. In Luke, the journey takes the better part of ten chapters, chapters 9 to 19. Whereas Matthew places his extra material that wasn't in Mark into five discourses, Luke places his extra material into a journey narrative. That's a literary form that would be well known to Luke's Gentile readers. So this lets us know that the stories about Jesus are not in chronological order. Some stories unique to Luke. If we didn't have Luke, we wouldn't know about the Annunciation of Gabriel to Mary, her visit to Elizabeth, the story of the shepherds and the angels at Bethlehem, or Simeon and Anna greeting the infant in the temple. We wouldn't have the canticles of Zechariah, the canticle of Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord, uh, the canticle of Simeon, or the hem of the angels at the birth of Jesus, glory to God in the highest. We wouldn't have the story of the boy Jesus in the temple, the story of the cleansing of ten lepers. He cures lepers in other Gospels, but ten at one time, only in Luke. The story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who's short so he gets up in the tree to see Jesus. The unique stories in the Luke and Passion narrative, the healing of the ear in Gethsemane. In all the other Gospels, the poor devil is still bleeding when Jesus is led off to Pilate. In Luke, and only in Luke, he's healed. Jesus is mocked by Herod, only in Luke. The women of Jerusalem weep for Jesus, only in Luke. In Luke, the crowd does not mock Jesus when he's on the cross, as they do in Matthew and Mark. Only the soldiers and the Jewish leaders mock Jesus on the cross, and the crowd simply watches and after Jesus dies, only in Luke's gospel, the crowd returns home beating their breast, a sign of repentance and sorrow for what their leaders have done. Only in Luke do we have the apparition on the road to Emmaus. Luke gives us geographical theology. For Luke, all of the resurrection appearances are in the Jerusalem area. The ministry of Jesus begins in Galilee, comes to a climax with the death and resurrection in Jerusalem, and spreads from there to the ends of the earth, which would be, for Luke, Rome. To have an apparition in Galilee would be a step backwards in this symbolic plan. So the disciples are commanded in Luke Stay in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. For Luke, that happens on Pentecost. So for Luke, the disciples are in Jerusalem the whole 40-day period. There's no space in Luke's narrative to insert an apparition on a mountain in Galilee or by the Sea of Galilee. So there's commanded to stay there and also the angels at the tomb speaking as a chorus. It says, they said to the women. So you have to imagine two people talking at the same time. Luke's audience, since they went to Greek plays, they would know all about choruses. Speaking as a chorus, they rephrased the command of the Mark and angel. In Mark, the angel says, go to Galilee. There you'll see him. Luke has geographical theology. His angel can't say that. So he says, remember how when he was in Galilee... He told you all this was going to happen. So I call that Luke in sleight of hand. If you're reading real fast, it looks kind of like the same as what Mark had. But if you read it close, you see that he's really made an important change there. The parables found only in Luke, the good Samaritan, the lost coin, the prodigal son, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich fool, and the dishonest steward. If we didn't have Luke, we wouldn't know any of those parables. Stories involving women which are found only in Luke, 
the women minister to Jesus and his disciples in Galilee. That's in chapter 8. In the first gospel to be written, Mark, the first time you hear about women is after Jesus is dead. And Mark says, at the back of the crowd, there were these women. Oh, and by the way, when Jesus and the guys were in Galilee, these women used to minister to them back then. Luke actually puts the story there. Martha serves the meal while Mary listens to Jesus. Jesus forgives a sinful woman. The healing of a crippled woman on the Sabbath. Jesus raises the widow's son at Nain. And the parable of the widow and the dishonest judge. All of these are found only in Luke. Luke also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. This work describes the spread of the early church from Jerusalem to Rome. We normally read the Acts as in the seven weeks between Easter and Pentecost. John. The last of the Gospels to be written, probably chapters 1 to 20 were put into writings in the mid-90s. Chapter 21 is an appendix from about the year 110 A.D. Second century tradition assigns this Gospel to John, usually, but not always, identified with John the son of Zebedee. And sometimes John the son of Zebedee is identified also with the beloved disciple. Most scholars think that on the Feast of John, Apostle and Evangelist, we are honoring several saints. Raymond Brown proposes four characters which he regards as separate, but which popular piety has often merged into one figure. John, the son of Zebedee, the beloved disciple, who was not a member of the Twelve, but lived in Jerusalem, which is why he's only mentioned in the part of the Gospel that deals with Jerusalem. The evangelist, who wrote chapters 1 to 20, about the year 95, and a final disciple who added chapter 21. The structure... We have the introduction, which is the poetic prologue, the testimony of John the Baptist, the calling of the first disciples. Then chapters 2 to 11 are called the book of signs, and chapters 12 to 20 are the book of glory. Chapter 21 is an appendix or an epilogue. In the book of signs, the typical pattern is sign plus discourse. Sometimes the discourse comes early, and then the sign. Sometimes it's the sign, then the discourse. And the seven signs are the wedding at Cana, the healing of the royal official's son, feeding the 5,000, walking on the sea, healing the man born blind, and raising Lazarus. In the book of glory... For the synoptics, Jesus' glory begins with the resurrection. For John, the glory is called lifting up, and it begins with the passion narrative. Lifting up includes crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And it's because of this perspective on the passion, that it's actually part of the glorification, that Christians dare to call Good Friday good. And it's why on that day we always read the Passion according to John. On Palm Sunday we alternate Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. But on Good Friday, always John because of his glorious portrayal of the crucifixion. Peculiarities of John. In John, Jesus cleanses the temple in chapter 2 at the beginning of his ministry instead of at the end of the gospel, the week that he dies. The other evangelists devote one chapter to the Last Supper. John devotes chapters 13 to 17 to this meal without saying anywhere, this is my body, this is my blood. In Mark, followed by Matthew and Luke, Jesus goes to Jerusalem as an adult only once to die there. In John, Jesus makes several trips to Jerusalem. In John, we have I am statements. In Matthew and Luke, we have a parable about a good shepherd finding his lost sheep. In John, we have the discourse, I am the good shepherd. Other I am statements, the living bread, the bread of life, the sheep gate, the way, the truth, and the life, and I probably didn't get them all. Also, the absolute I am, 
Only Jesus, as portrayed by John, claims the divine name, I am. No other gospel reports such statements by Jesus. The discourses in John, these are the results of decades of prayer, worship, and meditation after the resurrection. These insights from the, these decades of prayer, worship, and meditation are presented as monologues which Jesus gave during his lifetime. Liturgically, we read these during Easter time, from Easter to Pentecost. This is appropriate. We hear these words liturgically as the words of the risen Christ addressed to us today. Some stories unique to John, not found anywhere else in the Gospels. The wedding of Cana, the Samaritan woman at the well, the healing of the man born blind, the raising of Lazarus, stories about the beloved disciple who's not even mentioned in another Gospel. Jesus washes his disciples' feet, the apparition to the disciples without Thomas, the story of doubting Thomas, and the apparition by the sea of Galilee with the threefold question to Simon Peter, do you love me? And there we have done the Gospels and Acts.